morning, church. I'll be reading from Matthew 5, from verse 27. Adultery begins in the heart. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. My name is Reino, if we haven't met. I have the privilege of serving this church as pastor and elder. I also have the privilege of uh, preaching this morning. We are doing this Real Talk series because we, this is now Lesejo and I, and some other uh, leaders in our church, felt like we needed honest, open, and candid conversations about things going on in our lives. Listen, not only in our community, but also in our church family. These things are stifling our spiritual growth, fam. It's hindering the growth of our community. It's hurting our families. It's hurting our marriages. And it's hurting our testimony as followers of Jesus who are supposed to share the gospel with everyone. Sex is one of those things. So today, we are going to talk about bad sex. Real talk. I was first exposed to pornography when I was 10 years old. I sat in class at school, and one of my mates said, dude, check this out. And he handed me a deck of play cards. And on the deck of play cards, there were some, well, pornographic or explicit images. A year later, when I was 11 years old, a girl in my classroom brought a pornographic magazine to school, And as we sat in class, busy learning from the teacher in math, she went, psst, psst, look here. And when I looked to my left, she opened up the magazine at the center spread and literally just held it out to me. When I was 13, another mate of mine said, dude, come check this out. I found something under my brother's bed in a a shoebox. And he pulled out two pornographic magazines. And we sat there looking at all of those images, paging through them. A couple of weeks later, another mate said, listen, I found some stuff in my dad's closet. Let's put it in the video machine. You guys remember video machines? Let's put it in the video machine and see what it is. I was 13 years old at the time. The year was 1998. And I can still remember vividly the rush that went through my body. Like I remember vividly that feeling of just being completely overwhelmed by what I'm seeing. Because what I'm seeing is awakening stuff inside of me. I mean, 13 years old, hitting puberty. It's awakening stuff inside of me that I've never felt, and I've got no idea what to do with it. Later that year, 13 years old, we uh, got sex education at school. And I remember, uh, do you guys remember a projector that had those transparent pages on it, right? This is the male reproductive organ. Boom! And it's projected on the screen, and then you look at that little sketch, and you go, my word, that does look different than what it looks like in real life. So then we got sex ed at school, and I remember sitting in sex ed, feeling really conflicted as a 13-year-old, and here's the reason. On the one hand, I knew that what they were teaching us was good, and it was right. And at the time, still overtly Christian, right? When I was in grade 7, a school could be Christian without any issue. So I knew that what they taught me was good. But I didn't get the same feeling that I got looking at those transparent images as I got looking at all the other stuff. So I was conflicted because I hear what you're saying, but this just looks and feels much better. 
When I turned 14, the internet became mainstream in South Africa. I mean, it was already in South Africa, but then it became mainstream. I just wasn't clever enough to know how to navigate the internet. I was an outside boy, running and playing with a ball. So at the age of 15, one of my mates brought me a stiffy. You guys remember a stiffy? A hard disk that you inserted into a computer's disk drive that went... And then it had like one or two meg storage. And on the stiffy was a picture of Pamela Anderson. And I remember going, dude, where on earth did you get this? And he said, dude, I got it on the internet. And then I said, dude, teach me the way. And from 16 to 21 years old, pornography was like an avalanche in South Africa. Because the internet grew. Everyone got more clever. Computers became more mainstream. Cell phones became more mainstream. Now, I mean, we couldn't watch porn on cell phones back then, but we could call one another and text one another and send one another places to go and find the stuff that we were looking for. Fam, between 16 and 21, if I think back of those years now, it literally feels to me like sex and porn was everywhere in my life. I was just surrounded by it. I got saved when I was 19 on the 17th of May, 2005. Shortly before my 21st birthday, I started dating someone. And I can vividly remember the struggle I had with sexual desire, with lust, with obedience to God's Word, with purity, and with right and wrong. It was a heavy struggle. At that time, I had already accepted the call to ministry. So I already started my theological studies to become a pastor. I was a devoted and a very passionate young man who felt attraction towards my girlfriend, who felt arousal when we were together, who really had the need for intimacy. I mean, I was an adult then. But I quickly realized in that relationship that my sexuality was deeply broken. And it was deeply deformed because of everything that I was exposed to in my early years of my life. I knew what was right. I knew it. I knew what was biblical. I knew what good sex was. We'll get there next week. I just had no way of getting there. It's like I wanted it. I really did. And I believed in what the Bible taught about it. And I longed to live pure in front of God and with my girlfriend. But I was just too deformed. Like I couldn't get there. Think for a second of a, of a bent bicycle rim, like proper bent, like this. You can get on that bicycle and you can try all you want to ride that bicycle. You will get nowhere. Why? Because the rim needs to be reformed back into its original shape for the bicycle to actually move and to take you somewhere. Shortly before my 21st birthday, someone who discipled me back then said to me, you need to deal with lust. And here's what he said, lust will kill you and everything God has for you. Marie and I got married in January 2012. So a big part of the five years and four months between my 21st birthday and our wedding day was spent crying out to God, and submitting to His Holy Spirit to fix me for my bride one day. Like that was the mission. Please, I want to have a bride one day. Fix me so that she can get a whole groom. I spent that time crying out to God to cleanse me from all the impurity, to liberate me from lust, to delete all the images I had stored in my head of all those years of exposure to pornography and explicit material, to reform my sexuality back to its original shape so that I would be able to experience sex for all it was created for. Fam, real talk. It was hard. At times it was brutal. I had to repent so, so many times. I fasted once for seven days. And I wrote down every single sin that I ever committed or that I could think of on an exam pad. And I filled it. It was hard. And that was just a moment. 
I had to confess how many times. I had to ask for forgiveness. I had to be honest. And all of this multiple times in multiple seasons. It was a hard journey. But it was a journey that was so worth it. Lust will kill you and everything God has for you. The person who discipled me didn't make this up. He was paraphrasing Jesus. Did you hear Jesus in our teaching text? For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. In South African English vernacular, that is kill lust or it will kill you. Real talk. Lust leads to bad sex. Lust makes for bad sex. Lust deforms your sexuality. Lust will destroy you. That's Jesus' main point in the teaching text. That's my main point today. Hear me today. Listen. I'm telling you now, at the end of this service, I am going to give you an opportunity to respond. Because you can't hear the good news of Jesus Christ and not respond. It's either yes or no. And at the end of today's service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to either repent or to confess or to admit or to believe or to do whatever you need to do when it comes to this topic of bad sex. Do not harden your heart. Don't do it. Do not allow the enemy to whisper lies into your ears that you are okay if you are enslaved by sin and lust. Do not be overcome with fear and guilt and shame when we reach the end of the service. Do not do it. Listen to the Holy Spirit and obey right away. I'm telling you now that that's what's coming. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we hear you loud and clear. We realize that it is you talking to us today, not a story that was written down on the pages of a book. We realize, Lord Jesus, that you were very, very serious about the topic that we are about to discuss. May we hear your voice today. May your spirit do something deep inside of us. May we respond in obedience. May we be cleansed and liberated and given grace and mercy today as we tackle this topic. Lord Jesus, our lives are open to you. Work in us, we pray. Amen. With regards to the theme, bad sex, three questions. Look at it with me. One, what is sexual desire? Two, what is lust? Three, how do we kill lust? Here we go. What is sexual desire? Read with me a passage from the Bible. Song of Songs, chapter 7, verse 6 to 8. This is a man speaking, and not only is he a man... He's a husband, and not only is he a husband, he's looking at his own wife, and not only is he looking at his own wife, they are both naked. Here's what he says. How beautiful you are, and how pleasant, my love, with such delights. Your stature is like a palm tree. Your breasts are clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree and take hold of its fruit. May your breasts be like clusters of grapes and the fragrance of your breath like apricots. Read with me, Song of Songs, chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. This is the woman looking at the man, the wife looking at the husband, both naked. His eyes are like doves. Beside flowing streams, washed in milk and set like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice, mounds of perfume. His lips are lilies dripping with flowing myrrh. His arms are rods of gold set with beryl. His body is an ivory panel covered with lapis lazuli, which is a sapphire-like jewel. Husband and wife. Naked, open, vulnerable, without pretense, and so ready for sex. This is sexual desire. And there is nothing, fam, listen to me. Nothing sinful, nothing wrong, nothing out of place, or nothing weird about what I just read to you. This is beautiful. This is the way God created us. 
And we were created with the ability to experience this. Do you guys realize that? God created sex. It is His gift to us. The husband looks at the wife and he says, What a beauty. I will climb the tree. The wife looks at the husband. Do you know what she actually says in Hebrew? Have you guys ever heard of the term a euphemism? It means saying something a little bit softer that doesn't feel awkward. You know, like if you say to a kid, Ooh, someone made a stinky. That's a euphemism. Look at the teaching text, uh, the text in, uh, in Song of Songs chapter 5. Do you know what the ivory panel refers to? It refers to her husband's erection. So she looks at him and goes, what a hunk. What an erection. That is sexual desire. And we were created with bodies, listen to me, in which all of this happens. Do you realize, fam, that Jesus, the most perfect being ever, had a body? Do you realize that Satan, the most imperfect being ever, had no body? Do you realize that? Do you realize that Satan and all his demons are forever looking for bodies to stay in? And do you realize that Satan and all his demons, forever looking for bodies to stay in, seeks to destroy your body? Because your body was made good. Our bodies were made good. Hashtag our bodies matter. And sin is a destruction of the body. Do you guys realize that? The only thing that persistent sin does is it ruins your body. And then Satan goes, yes, I could never have one. Because the body was created good. So I'll ruin everyone else's. All of this happens in our bodies. Our bodies were given to us as a gift. And we were made to be little statues of God, reflecting Him to all of creation. Having a body is part of being created in God's image, fam. That's why Satan can't have one. Real talk. Every time I see Marie naked... I lose my mind. <laughs> I do every single time. Every time. Did you see the husband and wife in Song of Songs breaking out in poetry? Why? Because normal words just can't express the experience and feelings that come with sexual desire. Because sexual desire goes beyond that. It is special. We don't talk this way about anything else we value or desire. I mean, have you ever written a poem about your work? Or your bicycle? Or your favorite hamburger? Right? You never look at it and go, oh, words cannot express what I'm currently experiencing. But sex does that to us. Now, this will be our focus for next week when we talk about good sex. I just had to set the stage while I was able to say erection because next week will be a parental guidance service, right? So we won't have an 18 age restriction next week. So what is sexual desire? It's the experience of attraction and arousal that leads to intimacy and the longing for intimacy between a husband and a wife. The right and only place to experience this intimacy. Have you got me? It is personal. It is in the right place. It is ordered it is good. We praise God for it. More about this next week. What is lust? Let's go back to the teaching text. So I made some highlights for you. In this teaching text, listen, Jesus, Jesus is explaining how things work when He's King. My kingdom, my rules, this is how we roll in this place. That's what Jesus is busy teaching. So in Matthew chapter 4, it says that Jesus went around preaching the good news of the kingdom. And now what he does is he takes six well-known laws and he gives them new meaning and application. Why? Listen. Because they were abused. The laws were there, but they were abused. And Jesus came because he has the authority to reinterpret the law. So look at it. He starts with the first highlight. Do not 
commit adultery. And with that, Jesus is confirming, solidifying, affirming, and clearly stating that sex belongs between two people and two people only in the covenant of marriage. There you go. Case closed, no ifs, no buts here. And then he uses the phrase, looks at a woman lustfully, and then he says committed adultery, and then he points to a place that we don't naturally associate with sex, the heart. Let me make this plain. Check this. Don't do this. This is Jesus. And that is adultery. If you do this, look lustfully, you are doing this, adultery. So you shouldn't do this, both adultery and look lustfully. Do you see what Jesus says? Now let me just take a quick side road here. And let me go back to the first point of what sexual desire is. If ever Jesus Christ wanted an opportunity to denounce sexual desire and the act of sex as sinful, dirty, and wrong, this was the moment. Like this is his moment to talk about sex. And he doesn't denounce it. He doesn't say it's dirty. Do you see what he's speaking against? He's speaking against adultery and lust. He's not speaking against sex. Okay, so what does it mean to look lustfully? The Greek word in this text, you guys know that the New Testament is written in Greek, means set one's heart upon something, to long for something, to covet something, and to desire something. Most of the times when this word is used in the New Testament, it's not connected to sex. It's also not connected to sexual desire. Listen, it is connected to really wanting something because you believe that is what you really need. Right? So coveting something. You can't stop longing for it or desiring for it because the need to have it is really, really deep. Let me show you an example. Luke chapter 15. Verse 16. Lesego preached out of this parable a few weeks ago, so I'm going to assume that you've heard the parable of the prodigal son, or the parable of the awesome dad and the two boys, if you want to say it that way. Look at that word. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. This is the younger boy who took his inheritance, who squandered all of it, who had nothing left, and who during a time of famine had to work as a laborer. And now he's looking at big slop, going, oh, how much I want this. How much I desire this. How hungry I am. I really need this. This will satisfy me. That's what that Greek word means, is using something or wanting something in an impersonal way because it's a something, not a someone. Do you see it? It's, and it's all about me and all about my need and then trusting that that will bring the fulfillment that only God can give. Remember, that is idolatry. If you long for something so much that you think that it will fully and finally satisfy you, you are worshipping it. You are making something that is good into an ultimate thing. And that's idolatry. Nothing could ever fully and finally satisfy you. But when you long for something, when you desire it, when you covet it in this way, it is impersonal and it is, the correct English word is inordinate. Or maybe a better South African English word is, it's disordered. So it's impersonal and disordered desire. That's lust. We are going to get back to what impersonal and disordered means. But let's just get back to Luke 15. That's not what the boy needs. The boy needs to go home. Do you see it? The boy needs to say sorry. The boy needs his dad and his family. That's what he needs. But this boy's desire is so turned in on himself and so selfish that he is desiring something that is completely out of question. Humans shouldn't eat pig slop. Do you see it? <clears throat> In the same way, you shouldn't have sex with anyone other than your spouse. It's disordered. It's bad sex. It's impersonal. <clears throat> it's not about a someone. It's about a something. Let's go back to the text. Let's go slow. 
Look at the teaching text with me. With those highlights, here's what Jesus says. If you look at someone and you desire them in an impersonal way, right? A way that is all about you and the fact that you want to use them for something. Or if you trust that this person you are looking at will bring you the fulfillment only God can give, right? I really, really need and want this. Or other, uh, stated otherwise, this is what I ultimately need. Jesus says, it's as good as having sex with them and committing adultery with them. There you go. It still happens in your body, but it happens in your heart. No one can see it, but you know it. And Jesus says that's sin. Don't do it. Look, it's not about the noticing. It's impossible not to notice beauty. I mean, we've got eyes that can see in 16 million colors. Do you know what I mean? It is about, listen, about the choice before you after you have noticed. Do you see it? So you notice and then you choose. And then you either choose to keep it personal and ordered or you choose to look and to really want and looking in such a way that you believe that it will bring you fulfillment. In the time of Jesus, religious folk got all clever with this law and they made a range of excuses on how to bypass this law. Technically, you know, listen, technically, like, there, there was no penetration. So it wasn't really sex, was it? Or he or she wasn't married. So, I mean, there was sex, but, but it wasn't adultery because the other partner wasn't married. Or check this one. I'm not married, so I'm not committing adultery when I do these things. Or check this one. We are married in our hearts before the Lord. The Lord knows our hearts. I just want to say to you that He also knows your sin. It was consensual. That's another way to work around it. Like we, we spoke about it and both of us were cool with it. Some people in that time said, it's another appetite, it's another human desire. In the same way we need food, we need sex. So stop being so uptight about it. Okay, okay, okay. Here's what I want you to hear this morning. Jesus rejects all of those with one clear, concise, direct statement. And he says, if it happens in your heart, you're guilty already. Do you see it? Let's talk about pornography and masturbation. Last year in November, a guy called Dave Chambers wrote this article on News 24. The reason why I'm showing you this article is I want you to show that I'm not importing these stats from a different part of the world. This is South African stats. Read with me. South Africa consumes more porn than most countries. Porn aids masturbation, relieves stress, and sends us to sleep, the research showed. But most people say it simply makes them happy. Here's how the article starts. It's the weekend, and for many South Africans, that means it's time to get their hands on some pornography. Porn consumption rockets on Fridays and Saturdays. According to the new research, into who uses porn, when and where they consume it, and with whom, and why they like it. Key findings show that porn use dips dramatically when people reach their 40s. It is nearly always consumed at home and alone, and the most popular reason for using it is as a masturbation aid. I want to show you a few uh, excerpts from this article. So this is research that was done, not only statistically in terms of internet usage, but also one-on-one -on -one elaborate interviews. Let me show you this one. A 22-year-old KwaZulu-Natal security guard, for example, said he uses porn to get women, women, plural, who visit him warmed up. The man said porn actually takes something, someone to another dimension. I, I just play it, then I ignore her. I do my stuff, then definitely sure when I come back, her world will be changed. Because she will be like touching you. That's why porn plays a very serious role in my life. Impersonal. Disordered. Nothing about that is biblical or good. And nothing about that will lead to flourishing or fulfillment. Okay, 
Okay, I hear you. No, you see, I know the thing is, I just use it as a masturbation aid. Okay, let's talk about masturbation. Here's a quote for you, or another excerpt from the article. A 25-year-old woman told Koba, this is the professor that did the research, she also uses porn as a masturbation aid, and it can involve periods ranging from 5 minutes to 30. It's how much time do I have? Do I have to get this over and done with quickly? Am I supposed to be somewhere in the next hour? But I'm really, really horny right now. You've got somewhere where you have to be. But you so desire this thing that you'll do it. And that you'll do it quickly. It's impersonal. It's about you. And it's disordered. Now, look at the next part. People who say they use porn as a masturbation aid are sometimes giving a superficial answer, says the professor, because what they actually want is a remedy for stress, anxiety, or unhappiness. A 29-year-old unemployed man who is engaged said, if my bank account is okay, I don't have any stress. I am happy. My family is okay. My love life is okay. Then I don't need porn. A similar sentiment was expressed by a 31-year-old single man from Soweto who said, porn brings back something inside of me. It makes me want to engage in life again. When I feel like things are going well, there's no need for me to watch porn because I feel like I'm in charge. It's impersonal. It's disordered. And it's not just a masturbation aid. When we become sexually aroused, we experience a dopamine surge in our brains. It's a feel-good hormone that just takes over your whole being. When you watch pornography, here's what happens. Dopamine surges into your brain, and then immediately what your brain does is your brain tries to sense your emotions. Am I hungry, angry, lonely, tired, frustrated, stressed, unappreciated, unloved, blah, 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 blah. Why? Is this feeling so good? Well, it's because I have other feelings too. And then what your brain does is it takes a hold of those feelings, and then your brain takes photos of the environment in which you are experiencing this whole process, and it stores the place and the environment to use it again to lure you in. That's how porn works. So, the next time you are hungry, angry, lonely, tired, frustrated, or unloved, do you know what your brain does? Your brain sabotages you and says, dude, let's just watch some porn. Like you are at home, you've watched porn here before. It was epic. Do you remember all the feel good in the brain? Let's just get rid of all these bad emotions and watch porn again. And then you do it again. And that cycle just keeps on strengthening. It is a powerful, powerful addiction. Okay. You might say to me, listen, Reina, we are all adults in this joint, and we can choose what we want to do with our bodies. Fair play. Let me turn the screws a little bit tighter and remind you that kids come from adults. And that it's adults' job to take care of kids. And if you watch porn or you masturbate, you are not thinking about your kids. Let me turn the screws a little bit tighter and show you an article from a guy called Peter Stein. This was published in August 2022. Here's what he says. More than half of young South African children are regularly watching pornography, with at least 10% of them watching it every day. 35% of the children watch child pornography. 30% of the children watch Violent pornography. 65% of the children watch pornography between a man and a woman. And in this research, they said that they don't really care that child pornography is illegal. And there you go. Access to technology, such as, such as smartphones and tablets, is the biggest problem. 53 rapes at primary and high schools were uh, recorded last year in the country between 1st January and the 31st of March. One of these rapes was at a crash. I don't know what that means, but I want to vomit when I read that. In more than 40% of cases where children have been sexually abused, including having been raped, the perpetrators are other children. This is so-called child-on-child sex abuse. 
This is something that we have to protect our children against. And you will not protect your child if you watch it. That's the problem. You're pulling your child into a black hole of sexual deformation just because you can't control yourself. It's really important that we see this. Because kids stumble upon pornography on their, on their parents' devices. It shouldn't be there. Never. I remember reading a letter once from a, a, a 12-year-old girl. An open letter she wrote to her dad. She opened up her dad's laptop and she wanted to search something on the internet. And she bumped into the porn that he was watching. And after writing what she felt, and after writing how confused she feels, and after writing what she thinks of her dad, here's what she wrote, I wonder what you think of when you look at mom. I wonder what you think of when you look at me. I wonder what you think of when you look at my friends who come and visit. This is no small thing, and it is not just about you. Let's talk about what happens in our hearts. I'm going to, <clears throat> let me show you a quote from C.S. Lewis. Now, it's a man writing to a man. So it's all male and it's all heterosexual. But ladies, you can change the pronouns around. For me, this is C.S. Lewis. He says, the real evil of masturbation would be that it takes an appetite which in lawful use leads the individual out of himself. Right? Sexual expression. To complete and correct his own personality in that of another. And finally, in children and even grandchildren. And it turns it back. Do you see? So it's an appetite which in lawful use leads the individual out of himself. Now C.S. Lewis says through masturbation, unfortunately, it turns it back. It sends the man back into the prison of himself, there to keep a harem of imaginary brides. And this harem, once admitted, listen to this, works against his ever getting out and really uniting with a real woman. For the harem is always accessible, always subservient, calls for no sacrifices or adjustments, and can be endowed with erotic and psychological attractions which no real woman can rival. Among those shadowy brides, he is always adored, Always the perfect lover. No demand is made on his unselfishness. No mortification ever imposed on his vanity. In the end, they become merely the medium through which he increasingly adores himself. And it is not only the faculty of love which is thus sterilized, forced back on itself, but also the faculty of imagination. Do you see it? absolutely kills your ability to love towards someone else and it kills your ability to actually imagination to have an imagination for what sex is for now a note to our married folk who masturbate it might be that as a married couple you guys use masturbation as a way to connect with one another i just want to sound one warning if you are a married couple who masturbate remember that in masturbation you get what you want and how you want it Every single time. And that can actually deform your sexuality. Because it's not about you. And about how you want it. Porn and masturbation is no small thing. It is a very serious thing. And it stirs up lust. It will destroy you. And it will destroy others. Let me give you a better question to ask. Instead of is this right or wrong. Who am I becoming? Who am I being, uh, how am I being formed? That's the question you should ask if you're enslaved by these things. If this has you enslaved, repent today. The stakes are too high. We can't afford another deformed Christian. Let's talk about cohabitation and sex before marriage. Cohabitation means living together. Sex before marriage means having sex before you're married either with the person who you are going to marry or with someone else. From the beginning of 2012 up until now, I have conducted 235 weddings. My first 100 weddings, I asked the couples, do you live together and have you had sex with one another? Of my first 100 couples, 
72 couples cohabitated, they lived together, and 85 of my couples have had sex with one another. So after 100 weddings, oh, oh, check this, here's a little sweetener for you, all of them were professing Christians, all of them. Yo, 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 no, we, we really believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. The thing is, He's just not Lord of my body and my life and my values. Like I can give you lip service, but there's no way that the Holy Spirit's going to get into my penis. They were all professing Christians. And after a hundred weddings, I stopped asking because I was so discouraged. Like my wife and I could only have sex talk with 15 out of a hundred couples. I mean, those talks were glorious. It was awesome. And it was so exciting. But the stats are really poor. People say living together has some positives. Having sex before marriage has some positives. I put it to you, it has no positives. Let me show you. This is taken from a book called Divine Sex. Only one in five cohabitating relationships end in marriage. What I want you to see there is that four of those relationships end up in a divorce. Because if you live together, you live as if you're a married person. So if you break up, it's like a divorce. Don't think that a paper makes any difference in that sense. So we've got four out of five divorces of cohabitating people. Cohabitating significantly increases the likelihood of divorce. This is now after you've gotten married. Women who cohabitate multiple times before marrying divorce more than twice as frequently as those who live only with their future husband. So the more you cohabitate, the bigger the risk becomes of eventual divorce. Check this one. I think this one has a deep application in our community. Serial monogamy, this is a string of consecutive sexual relationships, actually hinders eventual marital satisfaction and increases the likelihood of infidelity within marriage. If you've had sex with multiple people before you get married, there's your risk. You are going to feel unsatisfied because you created a pattern in your life of wanting what you want and getting it outside of the right order. And you run the risk of infidelity because you want something that you might feel your spouse is not giving to you. None of our clever ideas around these things will work, fam. No justification for why we should have sex before we get married or why we should live together is worth it because it will leave you more miserable. Like I could quote the whole book, Divine Sex, to you. And you'll see how miserable people are who make this a case of lust and not of sexual desire. It is disordered. You are setting yourself up to become something with someone that is outside of God's will and design. If you cohabitate, I want you to deeply, deeply ponder this quote from Tim Keller. He says, when the Bible speaks of love, it measures it primarily not by how much you want to receive, but by how much you are willing to give of yourself to someone. How much are you willing to lose for the sake of this person? How much of your freedom are you willing to forsake? How much of your precious time, emotion, and resources are you willing to invest in this person? And for that, the marriage vow is not just helpful, but it is even a test. In so many cases, when one person says to another, I love you, but let's not ruin it by getting married, that person really means, I don't love you enough to close off all my options. I don't love you enough to give myself to you that thoroughly. To say, I don't need a piece of paper to love you, is basically to say, my love for you has not reached the marriage level. John Tyson, a pastor in New York, says, when you cohabitate and you have sex outside of marriage, he says, you're promising with your body something that you won't pay with your life. And he calls that sexual fraud. Because if it's ordered and personal, you are not only physically one, you are personally one, you are emotionally one, you are economically one, you are familiarly, I don't even know if that word exists, but I made it up, you are familiarly one, you are one in all of it, and it's all or nothing. Last two remarks on lust. Married folk, do you see 
that you can actually lust inside your marriage. If you look at your spouse in an impersonal, self-centered way, and if you worship sexual intimacy with your spouse to such a level that you feel like that will fully and finally satisfy you. And then, for the folk not having sex at the moment, so Shiami, I'm not casting anyone out of the conversation like you said earlier, do you also see that you can lust? Because you don't need to have sex to lust. It happens in the heart. Now, let me just make a note here. Sex is not a prerequisite for living a beautiful, perfect, and significant life. How can I say that? Jesus Christ never had sex. I want you to see that. And he lived the most perfect life anyone ever lived. So whatever your desire is around sex, sexuality, marriage, and your spouse, you have to see it through the lens of Jesus to see that that will not fully and finally satisfy you. That is not the one missing thing. That's not the one thing that you need at this time. Let me just make another note here. This is why our identification culture is so disordered at the moment and causes so much confusion, right? The culture that says, I can identify as. So I choose my own gender. I choose my own pronouns. I choose my own sexuality. The problem with that, according to this teaching text, is that I'm changing my desires and appetites because that is what I want. Do you see it? So now, something that I thought would bring me fulfillment is not bringing me fulfillment again, so now I just change. And I change to what I now perceive is now my need. And eventually, you, earn up, ach, you end up deformed and lustful because you're just following your own desires. All of these things that I've mentioned now, and some more, like I didn't cover everything, are impersonal and disordered, and they will stir up lust. And that will destroy you. How are we doing? I've got one more point to go. You guys with me? How do we kill lust? I think a good question here is, why do we have to kill lust? Well, look at the teaching text. Do you want your whole body to be thrown into hell? I'm just asking. Because if you want, go ahead. If you don't, you have to kill lust. I think it's really important for us to just see the teaching text in this context. Listen, Jesus is not saying that one day you will receive punishment and then go to hell. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus isn't saying, keep on lusting all you want. There will come a time of judgment, and when that time of judgment comes, then you'll go to hell. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, you'll end up trashed, Stinky, useless, and burnt like everything on the garbage dump. That's what Jesus is referring to. The Greek word he uses for hell is Gehenna. So in Jerusalem, you've got a valley that runs uh, 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 west, east, and north, south next to Jerusalem. So one is called the Hinnom Valley, and the other one is called the Kidron Valley. In the Hinnom Valley was a garbage dump. And what they did with that garbage dump is they burnt the garbage. So it was smelly and it was stinky. And everyone could see it. And you could also see when they burnt some garbage. That's also oh, the very same place called Bainom, where the people in the Old Testament, specifically in Jeremiah's time, burnt their babies as idol sacrifice. Right? So Gehenna, or the Hinnom Valley, was a horrifying place. Jesus says... That's what your life will end up like. Look at it. Like, use your eyes. Right there. Next time you pass by Jerusalem, pass by the Valley of Hinnom. And look at Gehenna. Look at hell. That's what your life will end up like. Do you want your life to be like that? Absolutely not. And Jesus says, that's why now, here, I'm telling you that you'll throw your whole body into hell. It's not someday, it's now. And that's the warning. Okay, so how do we kill it? We've got two body parts here. Can I maybe have uh, the slide that has... Yeah, there we go. We've got an eye, and we've got a hand. Do you see it? Okay. Here's the thing about the eye. 
it's not about stop looking. It's rather see it for what it is. Your eye needs to look at lustful. Uh, 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 uh. Your eye needs to look at lust in a new way. Your eye needs to see it for what it is, and that is, this will not give me what I most deeply desire. It's like eating a bag of Doritos when you're really thirsty, hoping that it'll quench your thirst. It's not going to work, fam. Like, see it for what it is. Doritos will give you a great taste sensation, but it definitely won't quench your thirst. And what Jesus says is, if you don't have the ability to see this for what it is, take your eye out. Gouge it out, and rather throw it away. The bulk of my sermon so far, fam, was to convince you that what these things really are. The bulk of my sermon was to help you to have a biblical view and a biblical perspective on these things. Jesus says, if you can't get yourself to see it this way, it still isn't an excuse to lust. Rather take out your eye. Do you see how high the stakes are here? Let's look at the hand. What do we do with our hands? We take into possession. We exercise power. <clears throat> it's the end of a, of a process of thought that starts with our desires. I feel hungry. I think of food. I walk towards the kitchen, I see the apple, I take the apple. Not a Genesis 3 apple, just like a proper job, golden delicious apple, you know what I mean? I take the apple. So with our hands, we finish a process that starts deep inside. We touch with our hands. We also hurt with our hands. The key application in terms of your hand is do something about it and do something differently if you struggle with lust. Like take yourself out of the way of temptation. Now, I'm going to count on the fact that we are all adults in this joint and that you can think for yourself how you should take yourself out of places of temptation. I just want you to see that it's the same idea as with the eye. Jesus says, rather go without it than living in sin and full of lust because of it. Get real, fam. Real talk. The time is now. And we shouldn't hold back if we are convicted of these things. Do you guys know, as adults, we actually have the ability to listen to warnings. Imagine yourself sitting in the doctor's room. And the doctor says, listen, you've got diabetes. If you keep on chowing sugar in this way, you're going to die. Do you know what you do? You change. You get up from the doctor's rooms and you go, I'm going to die if I continue doing this. Or if a doctor looks you in the eye and says, your heart will not be able to beat anymore. Stop this and turn. Do you know what you do? You get up the following morning and you change your behavior. We have a way of doing it. And in this same way, we should react when we hear these words of warning. Think about fire, fam. Fire is beautiful and glorious and life-giving and atmosphere-creating and a means to pry <laughs> and a means to food. Oh my word, am I hungry now? If it's contained, if it's in the right place, if you do not play with it, fire is awesome. Do you know how destructive fire is? If it's running wild and it's untamed. I just got photos this morning from a friend of mine in Canada whose whole city is burning up. They had to evacuate 30,000 people from their homes because of the heat waves that ran through the Canadian forests. That's not nice fire. That's not bright flash fire. But Bryflay's fire is phenomenal. And sex is exactly the same. Like contained in its right place, it is so life-giving. Take it out of that place and it will destroy you. So how do we do this? Do you and I say today, you know what? I'm going to make a decision and I'm going to change. Unfortunately not. It's not as easy as that because it's much stronger than that. No, no, no. Here's what you do. 
you ask God to put you back together. You have to admit that your sexuality is broken. And then after you've admitted that your sexuality is broken, you have to believe, fam. And this is what you ought to believe in. You need to believe that the cross is enough. You need to believe that through Jesus' death, He paid for your sin. You need to believe that on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. And that means that death will no longer reign and sin will no longer reign. And people will no longer be at odds with God they created anymore. It's all the, uh, reconciled. It's done. That's what you need to believe in. You need to believe that through Jesus on the cross, God showed His grace and His mercy to us. He showed us His love. If you turn today and you, accept, you admit that your sexuality is broken, then what you believe is that you'll find a father with open arms who'll say, I've been wanting to hug you and love you and reform you and put you back together for so long. Come from the darkness into the light. I'll put a robe on you. I'll put a ring on your finger. I'll put sandals on your feet. I'll throw a feast for you. That's who you'll find. Do not believe that you have to pay. It is paid. And through Jesus' ascension and the outpouring of His Holy Spirit, not only is He with us, He is inside of us. Everything you need to break free from this is in you. It's all there. And you just have to believe in it. Jesus talks of us, you and I, as His bride, fam. I remember what it was to wait for my bride to arrive on our wedding day. My word, words cannot describe my emotions. Jesus feels the same way about us. He doesn't see us as dirty, stinking people on the trash heap. He sees us as people created in His image who He wants to put back together so that we can reflect His image for His kingdom and for His glory. Jesus speaks of himself as our groom. That's the affection he has for us. And we believe this. I can't prove it to you. You just need to believe it. God gives you the gift of faith and then you take a leap. And then you confess. And you say, I need help. I need restoration. And above all things that you need, you need the power of the Holy Spirit to reform you. Let me give you some comfort from the Scriptures. 1 John 1, verses 8 to 9, and I'm landing. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful, come on, and righteous, yes please, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to show you an image. You probably have seen it before. If you have, just look at it again. If you've never, I'll tell you what it is. This is a Japanese art form called Kintsugi. Asako, you can leave the slide on for us, mate, and then you can uh, get ready for the response song, please. This is a Japanese art form that takes things that are broken and puts it back together. Not by using glue, but by using gold. And after it's been put back together, the art form is called Kintsugi, it has more worth than it had when it was whole. Fam, that's a picture of you and I gloriously being reformed and restored by God's grace because of His gospel. It doesn't matter how broken you are, piece by piece, bit by bit, God will fill in the gold and He'll put you back together. If that is what you want, I want to pray for you today. If your response today is, Lord Jesus, I desperately, desperately need your healing in this area, I want to pray for you. Let's close our eyes. I said earlier that I'm going to give an opportunity for you to respond. That opportunity is now. Do not harden your heart. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Obey right away. 
If you need to repent today, if you need to turn today, if you need to be liberated from lust today, if you need to walk free and into the light, this prayer is for you. Lord Jesus, we realize that the stakes are unbelievably high. And we realize that our lives could end up on the dumpster very, very quickly if we don't listen to you, if we don't admit our brokenness, if we don't believe in the gospel, and if we don't confess that we need your help. Lord Jesus, we need your help. And we believe that if we turn to you today, that we'll find you lovingly gaze at us like a groom gazes at his bride, welcoming us home, advocating for us, reminding us of the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us, and peace of peace, a piece by piece, picking us up and putting us back together, making us beautiful and whole and glorious again. Lord Jesus, we are sorry for all the times that we've hurt you. Sorry for all the times that we walked away as your bride. Committing adultery against you. Because we don't choose you, we choose so many other idols in our lives. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. I want to pray, Lord Jesus, that you deal with this thing in our community, and especially in our church family, in a decisive way. So, many, so much hurt is caused because of this, Lord Jesus. We want to see families being put back together. We want to see marriages mended. We want to see people healed. We want to see a church faithfully sharing the gospel with others. We want to be a, a light in this place. We want to be salt. We want to be different. Cleanse us from these things, Lord Jesus, we pray. All in your name. Amen. Amen.